Okay, now I may be going. First of all, thank you for coming to our research colloquium. We have these research colloquia every other Friday, so not next week, but we're very lucky to have Dr. Paul Marty, who is very famous already. <laughs> speak about Google and how it makes us intelligent. <laughs> or not. Or not. <laughs> we will. We will see. I'm hobbling around because I broke my toe on Tuesday. Oh, no. Nothing, because oh. Tuesday our 15-year-old had to have an emergency appendectomy. <gasps> so here I am hobbling around the hospital. Everybody's like, "What's wrong with you?" I'm like, "I broke my toe." Oh, that's okay. <laughs> so I'm just having abdominal surgery. Uh, I want to. Uh, I want to say. He's up furniture. I, 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 no. <laughs> Is it your little toe? No. Your big toe? No, it's this toe. Oh, so it's taped it to this toe, and that's it, right? No, that's all I can do. That's all you can do. Right, exactly. Well, let's, I've let's broken so many toes, him. so many times. We, we want to congratulate him for being nominated for Distinguished Teaching Award. He already got a lot of teaching awards, so the only the, the next thing up is he doesn't qualify for a teaching award, it has to be distinguished. So, I'm never going to win the Distinguished Teaching Award because we don't teach the way the university likes that to go. But I have, I have won the undergrad and the grad teaching award at the university level. So, yeah. so that's that stuck in the Congratulations. with that. Uh, I don't know who everybody is. I think, well, I don't know almost everybody. This is going to your name real fast. Laura. Sylvia Leonardo. Vivian. What? Rob. Who's on camp? Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, I got it, I got it all. Okay, I'm good. Just Dr. Chuck McClure, if you don't know him. Yes, I was going to say. Go ahead, Mia. He is the is it director yeah. of the Information Institute. And EPS professor. And our EPS professor, EPS or whatever professor. they're calling it now. Yeah. yeah. Whatever, it is, whatever it is, that's what I am. And just so you know, this is being recorded, so we need to watch what we're saying. How much time do we have? One hour. That's it? Uh, well, less than one hour. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I have always liked this cartoon. Uh, for those of you who can't read it in the back, I'll read it to you. It says, Life Before Google. I wasn't talking about you. It, Life Before Google, a short story. I just thought of something I'd like to know more about. That's a damn shame. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a funny story. Right. But for many people today, this is a true story. Uh, Google was incorporated as a privately held company in September of 1998. Our current freshman class was born in 2002. Our graduating seniors were born in 1998. More than 90% of our undergraduate students have literally never known a world before Google. And if you were, sure, hang on, I need a clicker. There we go, that's better. If you were born after Google was incorporated in 1998, in this country at least, and at a particular socioeconomic level, right, you were born into a world where instant access to online information was basically taken for granted. And if Google has literally been a part of your life forever, you may never have considered how growing up in a world like this has influenced your ideas, your expectations, and your shared understanding about how the world works. And I have been so fascinated by that phenomenon that back in 2015, I decided to start offering an E-series course on this topic, specifically so that I could learn from our undergraduate students about the world in which we now live. And I have learned much more from them than I believe they have ever learned from me. And it is very, very interesting. And I track a wide variety of variables about our students' perceptions about life in the <clears throat> instant society, shall we say. One of the things I asked on the first day of class is, how many of you have a Gmail account? And I'll ask you this now. How many of you have a Gmail account? Go over your, uh, Chuck's your hand. Yeah. Not going, yeah. So, yeah. No, <laughs> every, okay, everybody has a Gmail account. By the way, this year, as Juan knows, for the very first time ever, there was a student in class who didn't have a Gmail account. Uh, one. One. First time ever in the five years I've been teaching in class. I said, how do you survive without a Gmail account? She said, well, I just never needed one. And, and, then, and then she got in a small group of people who were you know, working together on Google Slides, so now she needed a Gmail account. That was it, right? Um, and now she's being tracked, right? Um, okay, so they all have a Gmail account, generally speaking. Uh, many of them have more than one, 
All right. Sometimes I'll ask if they have more than five. You have more than five. Just the one. I hit my 15 year old who just had his appendix out. He has like 20. <laughs> he makes different Gmail accounts for like all of his different online identities and they all have different names and he uses them for different services and then he emails me from random Gmail accounts. <laughs> emails, like the other day I got an email from somebody named Frank McMillan asking me to buy him traffic cones and I'm like, who the hell is Frank McMillan? Right? It turns out that's my son, Evan. Um, <laughs> so, then I asked them, how much do you pay for Gmail? And they all stare at me. Like, like I completely out of my mind, right? This is a generation that pays for nothing. <laughs> of course they don't pay for Gmail. Gmail is free. So then I'll say to them, okay, so who can explain to me how it is possible that Google is giving you Gmail for free? What are they giving out of the deal? And what I do here is I, is I watch the expressions on the students' faces as the hands start to come down around the room. And they're all looking like, huh. Does Google get out of this? Right. And for many of them, you can see that they've never stopped to question this relationship before in their entire lives. This has just been something that they have been given as a gift. And what Google gets out of it, they hadn't stopped to consider. Now, more and more, there are more and more students in every class, like started with maybe one out of 10, and now I'd say it's half, easily. That can explain. How Google makes money. How, how does Google make money? Data. Add. Add. Right. Uh, this, of course, is Lieutenant Commander Data. I'm sorry, this is Mark Zuckerberg from Facebook. <laughs> Explaining to the U.S. Senate in the spring of 1998, at the spring of 1998, spring of April 2018, how Facebook makes money. And how many of you watch this particular proceedings? If you haven't watched this, it's hilarious. Oh my god, you go watch this. I mean, uh, you also have to watch the Google one that happened later the next year, right? The fact that not a single person in our US Senate has any understanding of how any of this works, doesn't even understand the technology well enough to ask a coherent sentence or question, <laughs> should fill us all with dread. Um, and here, this is where Mark Zuckerberg finally broke. And basically, you can tell from his facial expression, right? Um, basically, had to explain. I, he was asked, how is it possible? You give your product away. How, how do you make billions of dollars? And he, it's, it's we run ads. And it's amazing how many people simply do not understand how companies like Facebook or Google make money. But even people who do understand this often don't grasp the scale at which these companies make money. So for example, this is the advertising revenue that Google brings in annually. This goes from 2001 to 2018. And as far as I can tell from looking at the quarterly results from 2019, the number is, it, it just continues this exponential growth. This is in billions of US dollars. In 2018, Google brought in $116 billion in advertising sales. And this is primarily uh, the Google AdWords ads. So when you go to Google and you type in a search and up pops an ad, right, that someone has paid for. So when you type in shoes, up pops an ad for a shoe store, that person, that's that money, added up to, in 2018, $116 billion. And to put that in context, the worldwide advertising budget across all media, print, and electronic in 2018 was about $580 billion. So this is about 20% of the worldwide total advertising budget spent on ads in that entire year went through Google's hands. Uh, you may remember a few years ago there was a guy who came and gave a talk here at FSU called the $500 trillion mistake. Uh, this was a guy who was one of the first five employees at Yahoo and was in the room at Yahoo when it was proposed that Yahoo could make money off of searches by selling ads based on what people were searching for. And the idea was roundly poo-pooed and not done. Uh, this was back when Yahoo was the internet before Google. And if they had found a way to capitalize on that, uh, maybe they, uh, well, would be a little bit better off. This is really astonishing to think about this, that a company that 25 years ago literally didn't exist, now controls about 20% of the worldwide advertising budget. And the reason Google was so successful at marketing all of these ads 
and convincing people to pay them to run ads on their platform is because of the sheer amount of information that they have about us. So they can offer extremely targeted, extremely valuable advertising services. So look at it this way. The key to understanding Google's success right, is that there is no market for a paid online email service. There is no market for a paid online video sharing service. There is no market for a paid online mapping service. Why? Because access to your information is worth a lot of money. By giving you these services for free, Google is able to glean so much information about your activities that then they can sell to people who want to target you with ads, that they, it is more, it is more cost effective for them to offer you these services for free than to charge you for these services. They make more money giving you something for free just so they can learn more about you and sell to somebody else. And that is really kind of astonishing. We talk about this a lot as if you're not paying for it, you're the product. You've probably heard people say this. Uh, if someone on the internet is giving you something for free, it is a pretty safe bet that they are selling information about you to somebody else. Um, and this is somewhat of an overgeneralization, and as many people point out, even if you are paying for it, you're probably still the product. Uh, but it is still relatively true that in today's on-demand world, a large number of companies make a significant amount of money, more money, selling information about you to other people than they can by selling their products directly to you. So much so that they are eager to offer you free goods and services just so they can learn more about you. Which is kind of astonishing when you stop thinking about it. Now, I don't know about you, but this is, this is not the world that, that I was expecting. You know, this is, this is very different from our expectations. 20 years ago, you know, back in 1980, if you had asked me, at least one chunk over that, if you had asked me what the future was going to look like, right, I, I don't know what I would have told you. Juan, do I need to tell you to stop talking? No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yes. Well, no way. Maybe I can help. What is it? No, it's 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 sorted. It's sorted. It's, sorted. it's, it's, yeah. it's taped. You're good. It's All right. Taped. Brilliant. I'm really happy. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so if you would ask what the world was going to be like in the 1980s, right? How'd you, how'd you know I was going there? That, that, was, that was what we thought the future was. Right? So, Back to the Future. <laughs> this is from Back to the Future Part 2, where they jump forward to the year 2015, which I think was five years ago now. <laughs> I remember they had all kinds of wonderful things in the future in 2015. Right? They had self-tying shoes, they had self-sizing jackets, they had flying cars, they had hoverboards, they had virtual reality glasses, this, by the way, is Michael J. Fox dressed up as his own daughter. Um, if you didn't know that, in the dinner scene of the future in 2015, they're all sitting around the table, and all every single one of these people is played by Michael J. Fox. So in this particular scene, they're all sitting around the table, they're all wearing these VR glasses, and what happens is the home phone rings. <laughs> they all have VR glasses, but they still have a landline phone. <laughs> and Buck pops on the VR glass that the call is for the dad. And they say, oh, the phone's for you, dad. And he says, I'll take it in the den. Because right? <laughs> they imagine all these technologies, but they don't imagine a world where we're all walking around with these devices in our pockets all the time. Right? And these differences, these changes, these are so funny. Right? Um, we turn many of them into jokes. So some, some of my favorites. Right. 1998, don't get in strangers' cars, don't meet people from the internet. 2016, literally summon strangers from the internet so you can get in their cars. <laughs> Uber. Yeah. Yeah. Um, people in the 60s, the government will wiretap your home. People now, hey, wiretap, can cats eat pancakes? <laughs> 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 And if you haven't asked the likes of this yourself, by the way, I will tell you the answer is yes, but only in very small quantities. <laughs> um, I, I, I love this one. 1965, I bet in the future we'll have flying cars and teleportation. <laughs> <laughs> now, 
I should point out, this is actually a joke product you can't actually buy. A cheese printer that prints your face on the melted cheese. But I went downstairs and I checked with Eric, who runs the Fab Lab at the Innovation Hub. He told me that it wrapped very nicely and it was relatively clean. You can bring in a block of cheese and he would later cut your face onto it. <laughs> Just so you know. Oh, oh, and this is a good one. 1989, that's Bill Gates. It's amazing to think what great and exciting things people will be doing with PCs in 30 years. <laughs> I love Smudge the Cat. It's such a good meme. Oh, oh, this next one is absolutely hilarious. Uh, 2009 is called a smartphone. It can do everything. 2019, stare into the nightmare rectangle and watch society collapse in real time. <laughs> okay, so they're not all funny. Um, I think that many of these changes are more frightening, right, than, uh, than funny. Um, welcome to the future. It's a, it's a scary place. We live in a world where Disney cracks everywhere you go, everything you do. How many people have worn that fan of Disney? No? Yeah. Yeah. It was a good experience, right? Was it, was it helpful? Uh, yeah. Was convenient, right? I mean, if you wear this band, you don't have to carry a room key. You don't have to carry a wallet. You don't have to worry about your fast pass card. You don't have to deal with anything at all because all the information that you need is on this very pretty and very attractive silicone band with Mickey Mouse on. In fact, these are collector's items. People buy them. People trade them. All kinds of wonderful things. Uh, we actually have a beta test one in our house, by the way, because Michelle was down at a conference in one of the Disney property hotels when they were running this out, and they asked her uh, if she would be willing to participate in the beta test where they put a tracking bracelet on her and tracked her throughout the park. She said, hell yeah. So, <laughs> so we have a beta one at home. Um, but no, super convenient, right? As I said, it takes the place of your room key card, it takes place of your wallet, you buy things with it, you check in and out of your room with it, you use your fast passes with it, you get it on and off rides. Uh, but it goes way beyond that, right? So it, it, it basically governs your entire experience at Disney. So if you have a reservation at a restaurant at Disney, and you do what most people do now at Disney, where you pre-order your food and order things online, well, they know where you are in the park, they know how, when you're going to arrive at the restaurant, they're tracking your location, they start cooking your food, they make sure it's all ready and brought to you the moment you walk in. Is it Gary a seat? Um, <laughs> if yeah. you have a reservation at Disney, yeah. Right? Uh, if you wait too long in line, right, they track this and they figure out what they can do to speed things up. Do your kids like Snow White? You don't need to go looking for Snow White. Snow White will find you. <laughs> <laughs> I've always liked this example, too. We live in a world where Target knows that you're pregnant almost as soon as you do. Um, but this is a classic example that's used in marketing classes all the time. So many of you have probably heard this story before. This goes back to 2002. Um, the best version that I've seen of this story is written up in a book called The Power of Habit uh, by Charles Duhigg, I believe his name is, which is an excellent, but excellent book, by the way, about, about making habits and breaking habits. Um, one of the hardest things that advertisers have to do is get people hooked on a new habit, right? You know, usually people have habits that are already pretty well set and it's hard to break them, but one of the things that people have to develop a new habit doing that they've never done before is when they have a baby for the first time. And if you get somebody hooked on Huggies, they're not going to switch the campers. And the sooner you can get them hooked on your product, the more you have a customer for life. So, in this true story, uh, a bunch of advertisers went to Target and said, we're trying to get our ads out in front of pregnant women as soon as possible. So we can get them hooked on our products. Can you get, a, get us a list of which of your customers are pregnant? And Target said, sure. Because pregnant women buy things that non-pregnant women don't buy. So they made a list of about 18 variables. And they wrote a little formula to figure out who's likely to be pregnant, and they gave this list to the advertiser. And the advertiser sent every one of those people on that list a wonderful coupon book with placement across the front of it, congratulations on your pregnancy. <laughs> so, now let me, let me say, they weren't wrong in a single case. Everybody they sent this to was in fact pregnant, it's just that a lot of them hadn't told the other people in their household yet that they were pregnant. <laughs> so Target kind of spilled the beans on a lot of people's pregnancy. Uh, they, they learned from that mistake and they haven't done that again. All right. We live in a world where Amazon knows that you're about to run out of dish soap, or toilet paper, or trash bags, and automatically reorders it for you. And ships it to you. 
Uh, anybody who has lots of scrap and save? Can I get down? There's a pantry too, right? Yeah, probably have. Uh, we just got the Whole Foods two hour free delivery option pop up. Has anybody tried that yet? Mm -hmm. yeah. No, because they didn't have ice. They didn't have ice? <laughs> they won't deliver their bougie ice. Oh. <laughs> but this, this is an amazing thing, right? Um, basically, so, so Michelle handles all of this for us. She has our everything that we buy that isn't perishable comes to us from Amazon Subscribe and Save. And all she has to do is calculate how much you know, dish soap do we use in a month, how much toilet paper do we use in a month, and then once a month, the correct amount of toilet paper shows up on our front porch, delivered by UPS as God intended, without our having to lift a finger. Why go to the store to buy toilet paper? When Amazon will keep track of how much toilet paper you need and automatically order and deliver it for you. And all I have to do is tell them how much toilet paper we use a month. And that, by the way, is worth 15% off our work. That information that, that they can turn around and sell to other people. Right? <laughs> Always like this example, too. I know where your cat lives. Professor Owen Monday, former our professor of art here at FSU, he's not here anymore, but this was an amazing project that he did about five years or so ago now. Uh, he was concerned about the fact that when you walk around and take pictures with your phone, right, it automatically embeds the geolocation. In the, in the picture, and how a lot of people simply didn't know that, and he, and he wanted to raise a, awareness of this privacy issue. So he went on the internet and uh, he found millions of pictures of cats that had the geotags. In. He scraped all the information off the pictures. He got all he, he anonymized all the pictures, and then he plotted every one of these pictures on a map of the world. And this website's still up, so called I Know Where Your Cat Lives, you can go there. The random cat button is the best thing in the world, by the way. You can just sit there all day hitting the random cat button and see random cats all around the world. And it kind of went viral at that time. It hit that trifecta of the internet privacy and cats. And uh, a lot of people were very interested in it. He was on all these news shows, and people were asking him about why he did this, and he explained it. And then in every interview, he said the exact same thing. He said, I called this website, I know where your cat lives, but I could have called it I know where your kid sleeps. All right. Are you spooked? <laughs> Should you be? Yeah. I mean, look, Disney's not tracking your location to catch you and harvest your organs. I mean, at least not yet. <laughs> um, Target's not tracking your pregnancy to kidnap your children. Amazon's not tracking your consumption of toilet paper so they can make fun of you. Uh, your digital camera is not embedding your location on your phone to make it easier for people to track your location. Right? All of these technologies exist to make your life easier. And technology has always been changing what it means to be human. Technology has always been the process of reshaping the human experience. And these advancements that we're talking about, in many ways, are all perfectly normal technological advancements. On the other hand, each one of them involves a trade-off, some degree of freedom and privacy in exchange for convenience. And the question, as always, is where do you balance that technology trade-off? What have you given up, and what have you gained in the process? So, for example, can you do a map without a calculator? Maybe. <laughs> I, I, won't, I won't put any of you on the spot. Well, no, was one, when we did this and when we did this on the first yeah. day of class, all these students were like, oh, I can do math on a calculator. I pointed to this, the student in the front row and I said, seven times eight. And she was like, oh my god, I can't do math. <laughs> <laughs> right? But no, there's a trade off going on here. If we can offload certain calculations to computers, and in theory that frees us up to do more higher order math. In theory, maybe we're doing that, maybe we're not. Um, I just like to think back of all the high school teachers who see and said you're not always going to have a calculator with you everywhere you go. Right. <laughs> well, it's like memorizing phone numbers. We're getting there. That's right. We're getting there. Can you read cursive? Yes. Right. Fewer and fewer students these days can. Right? And we saw it, by the way, uh, I mean, I don't think any of my, either of my kids can read cursive, but at least my 15-year-old was taught cursive, my 11-year-old was not. Right. So there's the, there's the line. And most kids now are not being taught cursive, and they're not going to be able to read it. But why should they? What? We're not, they're not taught hieroglyphics. 
I'm not talking about how to read uh, Fracture or other Germanic scripts. They can't read what their grandparents are writing. Well, yeah. That's right. But they, they email important. with their grandparents now. <laughs> <laughs> or they're on Facebook with their grandparents. That's yeah, right. what their, what their grandparents are, right? They don't even have a signature. They don't even, why do they need a no. signature? You just put an X? That's what I do when I sign things now. Wow. Hmm? The signature is just a holdover in archaic technology anyway, but there's no reason for us to sign anything. Um, again, what have we lost? What have we gained by giving up this skill? Can you change the oil in your car? I mean, I could, but at this point now, if I change the oil in my car, my car would yell at me. And the next time I took the car into the shop, they would yell at me. Right? Because the car is just basically a computer on wheels, and it keeps track of all of this. And if I unscrewed that cap, all kinds of alarms would go off. <laughs> right? Now, I mean, it used to be that people knew how to change oil in their cars. Now we sort of offloaded that off the, the domain of experts. What have we gained? What have we lost? Do you know how to read a map? <laughs> more and more of our students don't know how to read a map. They don't know how to read a map. No, they follow, they just they follow, follow the dot. They follow line. the dot. Oh my gosh. Right? <laughs> they do what they're told to do. Oh, my favorite example is one, one time we were, this was about 10 years ago, we were waiting for a babysitter to show up, and the babysitter never showed up. And finally, about an hour after they were supposed to show up, they called us and they said that their phone battery had died while we were driving to our house and then they got lost in Tallahassee. And they couldn't find their way back to their apartment. And eventually they got back and they wanted to call us. I got an answer. I mean, do you want that person walking? I asked you a question. <laughs> well, do you know how to preserve? Food. I was going to say on the map deal, we have a friend who relies heavily, shall we say, on GPS. This is somebody who touts his Green Beret time in Vietnam, so he's an older gentleman. Um, was at his brother's in Georgia, about half a mile away from the interstate, trying to go home. It took him four hours to get back to the interstate. Because he followed his GPS unit. Yep. Well, and this is a guy who's supposed to know how to read maps. Yeah. Okay? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. She had her set on walk and it was taking her down like <laughs> It was set on walk instead of drive, yes, exactly. Right? Well, this is exactly what happens, right? As we've given up these skills. Food, you know how to preserve food. That's what people do. Can you make food last more than a few weeks? Or are you basically assuming that any event of the zombie apocalypse are going to be one of the first eaten because that's my plan, right? I mean, if Publix is up there, there's really nothing that I, nothing I'm going to be able to do. I assume that even after a major hurricane, Publix is going to be back up and running within 48 hours, which is pretty much from what has happened, right? So I don't need to worry about how to preserve food. Again, it's a trade-off. What have I lost? What have I gained? Last one, do you know how to build fire? Can you make fire from scratch? No technology to help you, right? Or no modern technology to help you, right? I mean, if you were stranded on a desert island, we're talking about the probably the most astonishing, the single greatest technological achievement in the history of humanity, and we're basically content to push that this off onto the domain of technological devices. We assume we're going to have all the time. There was a time when everybody knew how to do these things. But of course, as new technologies get developed, and people develop new skills, and society gets more specialized, we tend to rely on new tools, new experts to do these things for us. People trade old skills for new skills all the time. It makes perfect sense. It's not necessarily good or bad, it's just part of what humanity has done. So when you see arguments like in this cartoon, this is what Mia said a minute ago, I'll read this to you. This is a Pearls Before Swine cartoon just from last December. Hey, Rat, I was thinking about inviting your mom to my party. Can you give me her number? No. Why not? Because I don't have my phone with me. <laughs> so? So my phone has all the information my brain used to have, thus my unused brain just withered away and died. <laughs> That's too bad. What's too bad? <laughs> But the thing is, we have been 
offloading the task of remembering numbers to technology for years. This has nothing to do about phones. How many people used to have a pocket uh, address book that they had all the addresses and phones in? You didn't have all the phone numbers memorized. You relied on technology to help you with this. And we have been relying on technology to help us remember things for thousands of years. And the best example of this, which I assume you've all, assume you've all seen because it shows up all the time, but just in case, this is Plato's Phaedrus from 370 BC. All right. So if you don't remember this particular scene from the Phaedrus, what's going on here is that Phaedrus is an Athenian aristocrat, is a dialogue with Socrates, and as part of the dialogue, they're talking, uh, as part of the dialogue, Socrates is retelling a story, so it's a dialogue of a dialogue of a dialogue, basically, between the Egyptian gods Ammon and Thoth. Now, uh, where they're talking about Thoth's many contributions to humanity, and among the other things Thoth did was uh, astronomy and mathematics and writing. And Thoth argued that his best invention was writing, and Ammon said that actually your invention of writing is a terrible thing. And this is why. That the discovery of writing will create forgetfulness in the learner's souls, because they will not use their memories, they will trust the external written characters and not remember of themselves. We have been having this argument for thousands of years. People say that the, the ability to use technology to record something is going to ruin us. Now, the fact that we've been talking about this for a long time doesn't mean there aren't things to worry about. Right? There are plenty of reasons to worry. We have big data tracking our every move, particularly insidious problem for us today. I mean, especially given the rate at which modern society is generating information about us. Uh, you know, the problem is defining data or what relevant data is, but if you just look at sheer chunks of, of digital data, right, we generate more data in two days now than we generated the entire history of civilization from the dawn of humanity to the year 2000. We're overwhelmed. Location tracking on our phone. Huh? We were just talking about this. Every, every now and then I freak out about this and I turn it off and then something doesn't work. So I turn it back on and say, okay, Google, you know where I am. Just tell me where I park my young car. Right? <laughs> Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, they know where I am all the time. And okay, fight with that. The crazy thing about this is that we're, we're doing it to ourselves, right? Uh, we are giving a very small number of companies a great deal of information about our lives in exchange for convenience. I mean, can you imagine the CIA or the KGB trying to convince people to carry tracking devices? And now, I carry a tracking device with me everywhere I go, and even more so, I bought this myself with my own money. And I'm as guilty as any, anyone. Take Amazon, for example. Right? This is the Amazon Prime Air drone delivery service, which is never gonna happen here in Tallahassee, because A, we have too many trees, and B, we have too many people who would shoot these down just to see what they are carrying. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact is, I rely on Amazon all the time. There are Amazon purchases showing up at our house almost every single day. And we know Amazon so well that are the UPS drivers, I mean, we're on first name basis, but our UPS driver. When the, when the boys were little, the UPS drivers knew their nap schedule, so knew whether or not to knock her in the door. And yet, every one of those Amazon purchases is enabling Jeff Bezos to take over the world. The owner of Amazon is the world's richest man, and he does not have our best interests at heart. Right? His entire goal, they don't just want Amazon to dominate the marketplace. They want Amazon to be the marketplace. His goal is a world where the only place you are allowed to buy anything is from Amazon. And if that happens, that's not going to be good for any of us. And the only way to fight against that is that we all need to stop buying things from Amazon right now. I can tell you that is not going to happen. Does Facebook um, have access to our Amazon? Facebook all of those ads come up? Well, Facebook doesn't necessarily have direct access, but, but they, as you move from site to site, maybe you do a thing that's leaving trails behind, which doesn't, they can pick up. Maybe there's their ways to fight against that, right? But even if they're not sharing the data, I mean, the fact is that there's basically five companies that are tracking everything that you were doing right now, right? Amazon, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, Apple. 
the question and is also how much do you sign in with your Facebook ID and different sites? Right, where are you signed so in? That uh, one uh, will be exactly. yeah, right there, the information. And we should point out there's no oversight over any of these companies at this point, right now at all, at least not in this country. <clears throat> And what I think is particularly frightening about how these companies are using their power is their ability to sort of shape modern day experiences. So take something like shopping, not online, but in a brick and mortar store. How many of you have been to an Amazon Go? Tass, I know you've been. You've been? No. Scratching. Okay. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> but Cassel, you've been, right? They have stores? Oh, so, yeah. Not here. Not here. Uh, Seattle, Chicago, New York now. Uh, so the Amazon Go store, this is a grocery store basically. A convenience um, store. They sell other things, right? Convenience store. Convenience store. Convenience store. So uh, basically, this is great. You walk in, you scan your Amazon app, you walk around the store, you pick up whatever you want, you walk out. That's it. Don't just walk out. Cameras and sensors are tracking your every move, and whatever you walk out, walk out with, they charge your Amazon account. Automatic. How do you wow. know they did the right? They did the right. It pops up on your phone. Look, here's what you walked out with. And I think someone also tried to pick up something, put it somewhere else, and pick something else and leave, and they still tracked it. Yeah, they're very accurate. Right. Right. If you put it back, it takes it off. If you pick it again, it pulls it off. Yeah, and the place you put it back doesn't have to be the same location. They know. <laughs> they're tracking everything that you do. And it's incredibly convenient. You don't have to talk to anybody. <laughs> you have to have the Amazon app on your phone. And there was a, a great example of the problem with this cause because New York apparently still has a law in the books that, that every store is required to accept cash. And somebody put the Amazon Go store in New York to this test. They insisted on paying cash. And it took an hour and a half for them to figure out how to accept <laughs> cash. <laughs> right? So, I mean, how was the tax though? Kind of was a lot of men. A lot of men. Yeah, based on where you are. And the, the dirty secret behind all of this is that Amazon's not going to force you to do this, but eventually, if you're not shopping in this way, if you don't have a smartphone, if you don't have the Amazon app on your phone, we're going to look at you the same way we look at people who try to buy food with checks in a grocery store today. Okay. Right? We've all been buying people who get out their checkbook. Yeah. <laughs> and this is, this is, anyway, have you tried going to a movie now without a smartphone? Uh -huh. All right. It's a very different experience. The, the companies themselves are not going to force you into the future. It's just going to get harder and harder to avoid. And the peer pressure to conform gets worse every day. One of the best places to see that is on social media. This is, um, of course, from Black Mirror's Nosedive episode. How many people watch Nosedive? Just one. Well, if you haven't watched Black Mirror, um, it's one of those shows that you need to be very careful about which episodes you watch. Um, <laughs> it's not a show that you watch sequentially through. Each episode, each episode is a is basically a standalone movie with What's different actors name? and different characters. It's Black like Twilight Mirror. Zone. It's like, it's like the Twilight Zone for the modern day. What channel? What is it on? What, what channel? What millennium is this? <laughs> it's streaming on Netflix. Okay. Right? Black, Black Mirror? Black Mirror. Okay. Mirror. Mirror. Yes, exactly. And each episode picks basically a different aspect of modern society and takes it out to its bizarrest extreme. So this is a good episode to start with. Certainly don't start from episode one, season one, and just go from there. That would be an absolute disaster. Um, but this, this one's from uh, season two, I believe. It's called Nosedive, and it, uh, it's got um, Bryce Dallas Howard as, this, as a starring character. And this is basically a world where social media governs everything. Your social media score indicates the kind of job you can have, the kind of car you can drive, the friends you're allowed to have, the apartment you're allowed to live in, all of this stuff. And you should be frightened of that because we are not very far from that world right now. And in fact, China is very, very close yeah. to that world right now. Right. So this, this is a wonderful look at what life will be like if your social media rating told you what kind of life you can have. Right. Um, it's a good episode to start with. It's called Nosedive. Uh, it's a good one to start with. And then if you like that, my recommendation is that you read reviews online of the different Black Mirror episodes before you watch them. Because there are some that you definitely don't want to watch. And there are some that I wish I could forget I ever watched. <laughs> like Nightmare. Uh, and, 
I mean, there are also there are some that are really brilliant. Are they gross or violent or what? Stupid. Take your pick. <laughs> different. Every, every show is different, right? They're weird. They're weird, <laughs> right? Um, you know, Paul, I, yeah. I have to jump in and say that counteracting a lot of this, there is some policy out there. California has just passed an incredible privacy bill. Yeah, their GDPR in Europe. And GDPR in Europe. And uh, more and more states in this country are sort of waking up. Now, our stupid federal... You know, the Congress, like you said, they don't know shit, okay? They don't have a clue what's going on. But there are states that are making huge headway right. uh, against Amazon, Facebook, YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So it's going to be curious to see how, how, much, how much they can actually... It, it will be. Us, right? It so will. Illinois, for example, still has, I think it's the only state left in the union that has a law against biometric identification. Yeah. And that is very interesting because what it means is face ID is illegal in the state of Illinois. Right. Right. Um, and this has caused a, amount of, a lot of trouble for companies like Apple. Uh, there was also, uh, a few years ago, there was a Google Arts and Culture app that went viral. It, was, uh, <laughs> it took a picture of your face and it told you what famous painting you looked like. Uh, if you lived in the state of Illinois, you weren't allowed to play. But the truth of the matter is, with facial identification, what you see on CSI and some of these shows is real close to true oh, yeah. about being able to run his face through a database of 12, 20 million, and boom, there's me. Right. Well, 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 where, well, where I'm going well, to they can catch other people. Well, well, yeah. So we have, we have the one hand, we have like, so China's argument is we're using this to catch criminals and just ignore the fact that we're also using it to identify dissidents and put them in concentration camps. Right, right. right. Yeah, it depends on the rules, right? Exactly. But the other, the other reason where I was going with this is, take for example, the example of Google about Illinois. People in Illinois complain vociferously. Why can't I play this game? Yeah, right. Right? <laughs> There's a law intended to protect their privacy. They don't care. They don't care. Right. Because right. 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 they couldn't play the game. Right. right. Um, and that, by the way, is also exactly what Owen Lundy found with his uh, I Know Where Your Cat Lives experiment. He thought he'd get tons of um, people complaining that his cat, their cats were online. He didn't get a single complaint that their cats were online. He did get a ton of complaints from people who went to his site and couldn't find their cat. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, think, I think your, your point in the beginning, Paul, which is that there is basically a whole generation of people who know nothing other than this. Well, and this is this is exactly where I'm going next, right? Because, oh, oh, this, by the way, just I was going to put some of these numbers in context. Um, this is the most popular social networks as of fall of last year uh, by a number of active users, and they define active users as you log in at least once a month. And Facebook, 2.4 billion individual users check Facebook at least once a month. And that is about the same number as the world's Christians, and it's more than any other world religion, and I guarantee you that those 2.4 Christians don't go to church once a month. <laughs> <laughs> I can't read. What, uh, yeah, Facebook, 2.4 billion. YouTube, 2 billion. WhatsApp, 1.6 billion. Facebook Messenger, 1.3 billion. WeChat, 1.1 billion. Instagram, 1 billion. These are monthly users. And again, what do people know? What do people understand? My favorite thing, I see Instagram on here is Facebook, right? I was talking to a group of middle school students a couple of years ago about, about these problems, and I had a very bright sixth grader say to me, she's very concerned, this was at the height of the Cambridge Analytica scandal, she says she's totally off Facebook, she's not on Facebook at all, she's very worried about her privacy, I said, that's great. I said, what do you use instead of Facebook? She said, oh, I'm all over Instagram. And I said, oh, honey, I've got that. <laughs> right. But people literally didn't know. That Facebook owns Instagram. Castle. Also, WhatsApp is below, yeah. below us to Facebook too. WhatsApp. And WhatsApp below us. All right, exactly. <laughs> right? All, uh, WhatsApp, uh, Facebook bought WhatsApp. Uh, again, not to get off into the, the economics of this, but there were 19 people working, 19, 20, something like that, at WhatsApp when Google, sorry, when Facebook bought them for $17 billion. Well, right? Um, but, so these numbers, astonishing, right? Now, back to the point that Trump was making. On their own, these technologies aren't necessarily scary. And, you know, people worry about what's happening to our brains, that people worry about our, our minds being taken over by technology, and there's a lot, of, a lot to that argument, right? There is no denying that every time you check your phone for a, for a tweet or a message or whatever, and it's successful, you get that shot of dopamine, right? You're being rewarded chemically for the information. It is, in fact, addictive, right? There are a lot of things to worry about there. But what's really frightening to me, right, is when people don't really understand what's going on. 
But people are not paying attention. Like the people who would rather pay a game, play a game than be uh, than be protected. Right. Um, Pokemon Go. Have you ever heard when Pokemon <laughs> Go came out? Right. <laughs> Millions of people logged into Pokemon Go the first day. Right. Oh. Including me. Including me. I mean, not me. I don't really care about Pokemon, but my younger kid wanted to play Pokemon. Right. So I download on my phone. I log in. Do I read terms of condition? No. I just blindly click accept, right? And Pokemon Go required you to log in with your Google account. If you didn't have a Google account, you couldn't play Pokemon Go. All right, well, of course, I have to go back, log in with Google. I didn't read the fine print, nor did anybody else that had turned it, nor did the programmers. Yeah. Because what they had accidentally put into the program was, in order to play Pokemon Go, you had to give um, Niantic the right to read your Gmail. <laughs> oh my god. It was a, they didn't intend it, they just clicked the wrong thing. But nobody noticed. It's all these millions of people just blindly giving the company the access to all their Gmail. Now they came out and they said they're not reading anybody's Gmail, this was a mistake. They didn't intend that. They fixed it. But nobody noticed. Right? So, let me just pin it up. Yeah. One of the uh, streaming services I really wanted to subscribe to because it carries basketball games that are not on anything else is YouTube TV. Yeah. Okay. So I pay the price and log on and get a two week free trial. And it turns out that if I had a Google account, I could have subscribed like that. But I don't have a Google account. So what I had to go through to subscribe, as opposed to see you you're suddenly being forced right. into using Google or whatever to get your information. And if you don't then it makes your life. It was it was a thirty minute baloney thing to try to subscribe. Right. Without a Google. It is a lot easier just to blindly click accept. That's right. And log in with Facebook. And log they know Google, this. Share my information. They know this. Absolutely. Of course they do. And so so this worries me when people don't know. This is what's really really scary. Um, this is from twenty sixteen. This is explain like I'm five on Reddit. I don't have any people in here on Reddit or being explained like I'm five. Always like to explain like I'm five stuff so Reddit. Uh, what assurance do we have that services like Gmail, Snapchat, Facebook don't can't view our I assume they mean mails, snaps, chat, etc. Right? And the answer from this guy who climbs naked, <laughs> no, no. Right? Gmail absolutely reads your reads your email. That's their whole business model. They straight up tell you that. You know, that said it's a computer program, not actual people. Bookmark that. Snapchat says they don't. We don't have a guarantee they don't, though. Facebook not only sees everything you do, they claim ownership of it all. Right? And then the original VOP, he uh, responds to his he goes by the name Asset, yeah. Damn, this is unsettling at least. And he's so unsettling, he doesn't know how to spell the word unsettling. <laughs> now, I understand why privacy is such a big thing nowadays. Oh, jeez. Right? <laughs> and you read these and you think, is this a joke? Could this possibly be real? If you spend enough time on the internet, you realize this is real. Right? There are people who literally don't know, don't understand. I bookmarked this because big changes happened after this was posted. Uh, and just last year, it was Google announced that they no longer read your email. <laughs> like, yeah, they've given up on that. Because it turned out they, they crunched the numbers and it's no longer cost effective for them to read your email. They still serve you ads, but they know so much about you that they were just wasting time reading your email now. <laughs> <laughs> but they could. They could. could. Yeah. yeah. And they used to. I mean, the whole reason they gave you Gmail in the first place was so they could learn about you and serve targeted ads. But now they found that by reading your email, they're no longer learning anything new. So it's just a waste of their time and effort. All right. Maybe your email was more interesting, but your email's boring. <laughs> <laughs> So, so once again, the question we're back to is, what are the trade-offs that we're making, and are they worth it? Right. Let's see how far you would go. We've talked about all of these, I think. Would you do this? Would you tell an e-commerce company how much toilet paper you use in exchange for a discount? Would you do Amazon subscribing site? <laughs> Hell yeah, let Amazon fly a drone to my bathroom window carrying a roll of toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, would you wear a location tracking bracelet at the amusement park? Go to Disney? Where? Sure. Mm -hmm. Super convenient. But I've seen a lot of hands going up. Really? Seriously? You're drawing the line there. <laughs> All right. Would you wear a fitness tracker that shares your information with your health insurance company in exchange for a discount? Yes. <laughs> Lots of companies are doing this right now. Lots of companies are giving you all sorts of benefits if you share this information. Lots of, and you have to pay very close attention to the to these things when they pop up, right? Uh, John Hancock which sells life insurance. They've got a deal where if you sign up for life insurance with John Hancock, they will give you a free Apple Watch. But you have to sign an agreement that says you will wear the Apple Watch a certain amount of time every day and give them access to the health data. Right? So they know whether or not they made a good investment. not just John Hancock. No, I was going to say. Lots of places are doing this. 
And this is the one where my students tend to draw the line. Right? <laughs> Would you let your insurance company put a speed monitoring device in your car? Now, a lot of the undergrads have had their parents do this to them. <laughs> but I get letters from our insurance company all the time. Save money. Let us put a tracking device in your car. No, I'm not going to do that. I like speeding too much. <laughs> um, so it all comes down to where do you draw the line. Right? And these trade-offs aren't good or bad. It's not, you know, an either or situation. We have to figure out where we are in this spectrum so that we can weigh what we consider to be important. And we have to decide, because if we don't decide where we draw the line, it's going to be drawn for us. And every year we keep getting nudged more and more a little bit further into this world of acceptance. And every time you get nudged a little bit further down that road, there's no coming back. I think ignorance is winning. Well, for sure. Well, that's been the case for a while, right? So if you aren't spooked yet, maybe you should be. As we head into the Internet of Things, as we yeah. hand all of our information over to all the people that we're bringing into our homes, all these technologies, we need to think about our choices. We need to think about the actions that we are engaging in before it's too late. And now my argument, and the reason I've been teaching this class now since 2015, is that I firmly believe that we have a shared obligation to society to be responsible users of this technology, which means we have to have the, the information literacy is necessary to understand the decisions that we are making and not blindly just click agree, not blindly just bring this technology on board, sign up for new services without understanding what we're doing. And unfortunately, most of us don't have those literacies. We don't understand what it is that we're doing. And we need people who understand that so we can move forward. So is Google making us stupid? No. No, it is not. But every year that goes by, there are more people that don't know a world without this technology. Don't know a world without signing in with Google. And while Google wasn't making them stupid, it has made it more important that we understand what we're trading off, what we're giving up as we go ahead and accept these things. Now, again, your line may be different from mine, which is absolutely fine. But we all need to know where our lines are and what happens when we cross them. Because unless you want to live off the grid, and if you don't know how to make fire, I wouldn't recommend it, <laughs> your choices matter. And if you don't choose, somebody else is going to choose for you. So we all need to reflect on these questions and decide what kind of world we want it to be before it's too late. All right, that's it. Questions? Uh, very good. I got